Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to a brand new episode of the Boss Babes Lifestyle Sports Podcast. We are back at it again with a, another brand new episode and it's Veterans Day. So shout out to everybody. It is Veterans Day, November 11th. So to all the veterans out there, thank you for your service. And I could not be more thrilled because one of my friends, Chris Griffin, he is the founder of Halio Athletica. You guys hear me talk about this brand all the time. I'm actually rocking one of their mint green tops as we speak. I'm posting about them all of the time on social media. I'm giving you guys discounts on their clothing all of the time. So you guys know that I had to have on today both veteran and founder of Halio Athletica. But before we welcome him into the show, we need to give a shout out to my friends over at Five Hour Energy. You guys know that they have awesome energy shots and also cans. They are portable. You don't have to keep them in the refrigerator if you don't want to. And they give you lots of great energy, jam-packed with caffeine, and vitamins. So again, shout out to 5R Energy. Check them out on social media and also on their website. Griff. How's it going? I cannot <laughs> believe I actually have you on here. You're always been, on the road. No, it's been a long time coming. And again, I, like I've said to you many times, thank you for your patience with me. Again, extending the invitation and just life being crazy with the military, everything. And then today, I just think it was it's fate. Uh, today's an incredible day for veterans, for military service members. And to be able to share this day with you over all the time that we've shared together uh, is really cool. Well, I want to first start off by saying to you, happy Veterans Day. I know that's a huge part of your life. Um, and I cannot wait to talk all about that. You guys are going to be hearing about Chris Griffin and all the traveling that he does <laughs> with being a yeah. vet. I think you're still actively involved in mm -hmm. the military. So I cannot wait to hear more about your story. But I want to first break the ice. Griff, yeah. if you had a superpower, what would it be and why? If I had a superpower, if it could be anything, it would be the ability to, one, snap my fingers on demand and have pizza pop up in front of me. And as I consume it, I don't, there's actually zero calories into it. My friends and family do know me. I'm obsessed with pizza. It's one of those things to where there's no such thing as bad pizza. There's some more better than others. But again, this may be a funny quirk one, but it's uh, if pizza on, on command would be my superpower with no repercussions with consuming all of it. Okay. So let's talk about this pizza for a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know it's weird, but again, it's uh, yeah, it's, I love pizza. Is there a particular type of pizza that you like, whether it be flatbread, deep yeah. dish? Do you like certain toppings? Do you like yeah. it homemade? Do you like to order from a particular place in Texas? So, yeah, I mean, so there is a particular uh, kind of pizza where I don't feel like a lot of people have had it before because you don't traditionally think of it. The first time I've had it and I was just experimenting with different toppings is there's a place called Grimaldi's. I know they're in New York City. Uh, they have two throughout Texas and there are a couple around the country, but they do an a pretty, pretty incredible pizza when it comes to their dough, to their sauce and their toppings, uh, just really high quality ingredients. But to me, something that will change your life if you decide to try it and you want to take a chance on this guy right here is a ricotta cheese and pepperoni. I uh, don't do the mozzarella, uh, just, you know, minimal toppings on uh, for what is going to go on top of the amazing pizza sauce. Um, but ricotta and pepperoni will change your life if you give that a try. I might have to give that a try. <laughs> I myself am Italian. And the only time I really eat ricotta is either in stuffed shells mm -hmm. or when my mom makes a lasagna. So I well, do. Hopefully I can offend you. So <laughs> we're taking the mozzarella off. No, it's totally cool. I'm, I'm <laughs> just saying, I think it might be kind of neat to try that type of cheese on top of a pizza. Yeah. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. I think, I think that's fabulous. <laughs> so you guys heard it here first from Chris Griffin. Go out and. Try new types of pizza, of course, the ricotta. Um, I think that is amazing that you would love that to be your superpower. And yeah. what is one of your top memories from 2021? It can be anything. Of course, the new year is upon us. Mm -hmm. I can't believe 2022 is a couple weeks away. Top memory. A top memory uh, from 2021 is actually going to come from, I deployed this year to Bosnia and it was the first time um, I was able to experience a diverse 
uh, country when it comes to how they're all they're split off by essentially three different sections uh three different factors of people there was the bosniaks there's the serbs and this the croats and they have all very strong beliefs and sometimes they're very different beliefs but what i saw as when i went there as a nato uh partner is that regardless of their difference to their beliefs and opinions they all collectively agree on one thing creating a great future for their children and a stronger opportunities to where they keep them in the country and they don't leave and go somewhere else in the, in the European Union. So to me, something that just really stood out again, you have all these people again, as parents, as adults, they can't agree on a lot of things, but collectively when we had opportunities to get together and, and bring them together, when it came to the children, bring this in a roundabout way and to, to put a good bow tie on it, we created this movement or this organization called Band Together. And essentially we had over $50,000 worth of donated instruments for these children to essentially come together and have the ability to learn and play these instruments because a lot of these schools didn't have the funds to, to purchase them. And so there'd be one student, uh, there'd be one instrument being shared between five to seven students. And so by bringing these other instruments in, they're all able to have their own instrument. And then we're able to throw a concert together to where, again, all these different parents from all these different corners of the country came together and enjoyed one singular experience together. That sounds like an excellent top memory. And we can talk more about that towards the end mm. of the episode when I ask you how your brand, Halio Athletica, is also involved with giving back in charity. A big part of my podcast is how do my special guests give back to their community whether that be the professional athletes that i have on here fabulous people like you chris mm -hmm. the significant others of the professional athletes and of course the reality tv competitors that come on here if you have a special gift if you have a platform the best way to give back is by doing things exactly like you are chris so thank you for sharing that top memory and I know that you live in Texas currently, and mm -hmm. of course you are a veteran, but before you were a veteran, before you got into photography, mm -hmm. before you even started <laughs> Halio Athletica, we yeah. want the Boss Babes fanatics to learn more about your childhood. Where did you grow up? And did you have any siblings? Let's talk about your early yeah. years. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, I grew up in a small town, uh, Havelock, North Carolina. So if you cut North Carolina in half and you go all the way to the coast, that's where I grew up for the first 18 years of my life. And it's one of those things to where we got lucky half the time if we made the weather map. I have two parents, and so they were in the Marine Corps. And my mom, she did 11 years in the Marine Corps. You'd never, you would never know. She's one of the sweetest ladies you'd ever meet in your life. Uh, incredible. And she's actually one of my inspirations. She's my main inspiration in life, actually, for what makes me work and push so hard to achieve the greatest version of myself that I can. And, you know, my father, he did around 14 years in, and then he medically separated because he was over at for Desert Storm and he was on patrol. And unfortunately, uh, there was an incident to where he got severely injured and he had to be rehabilitated and, uh, but I mean, he's still alive and here with us today, so I'm grateful for that. But when it comes to my siblings, I was a middle child and I had two sisters. And let me tell you, uh, I was tortured and punished on the daily till I was old enough to grow up a little bit and defend myself from the two of them. But um, definitely a, a great family, a great childhood and a, a great place to grow up with the beach right there. It was, yeah, it was fantastic. That's fabulous that you grew up in North Carolina. I'm currently here right now. I think you already know this because again, yeah, you yeah. and I have been friends for the last couple of years. My boyfriend is from North Carolina. I'm in love with North Carolina. It's still, it's freaking 70 degrees here and it's November. Where I'm from in Massachusetts, Griff, right now, it is probably mm -hmm. like 45 or 50. So where you're at in Texas, all the power to you. And in North Carolina, I'm loving the nice warm weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's no, it, and that's when I was actually deployed. I know um, I had uh, one of my sergeant majors. Uh, one, let, one second, let me grab my best friend and just to show you because he's one to make a little appearance. My best friend, real quick. Oh, hey, this little cutie. Yes, and so whenever I ignore him, what he'll do is he'll go uh, over to the water bowl, and even though he's not thirsty. He just wants and craves a little bit of the attention. But I just wanted to give him a little bit of love real quick. What is his uh -oh. name? And what type of dog is he? 
So he's an English bull terrier and uh, he's a rescue. His name is Zeke. I've had him for about five years now. Um, and he's, you know, he's my best friend. I love him to death. And but he definitely has these quirks to where if he doesn't feel like he's getting enough attention, if I'm on the phone, he'll do little things like that to let me know. He just wants a little pat, a little bit of love. Totally understand that. Um, I have a, a lab as well. So I, I get the little quirks that the puppies do. So hello mm -hmm. to your puppy. And what are some of your favorite holiday memories or birthday memories from when you were a child? I know you mentioned you grew up with two sisters mm -hmm. and they kind of tortured you a little bit. Oh, are they? Yes, a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, so Christmas memories. I think, I know this will all tie into my sports as well, because even though I'm from North Carolina, uh, my family on my mom's side, they're all from Michigan. Uh, and then on my father's side, they're all from Wisconsin and Minnesota. They moved a little bit back and forth. And so honestly, it's I think it's collective memories together. I don't think there's a singular one, but all the way up until like middle, like late middle school, beginning of high school, every Christmas, uh, we would travel up to either Michigan or Wisconsin. And because in North Carolina, where we live on the coast, you would rarely get snow. I mean, it would be fairly moderate. It might be chilly, but you wouldn't, it wouldn't feel like, you know, the, the television, the Hallmark movie Christmas, because it would just be cold, and everything being be brown. But going up to Michigan and Wisconsin, there'd be snow on the ground. It just, you'd be with the grandparents who spoil you rotten, sort of to get back at their kids because, you know, they made them go through the motions when uh, they were raising them. So we'd get spoiled by the grandparents um, and just really being there. And then I ultimately had a decision to make because I grew up uh, with my mom's side of the family, watching the Detroit Lions, the Red Wings, uh, the Tigers. And then up in Wisconsin, you know, there was a lot of Green Bay. And but as a young, a young boy, what really amazed me and grabbed my attention was Barry Sanders. And so I think, uh, honestly, going up on Christmas when we go to Michigan to see my grandma Foreman and my grandpa Jackie, uh, we're just sitting there watching Barry Sanders on TV and, you know, eating ice cream sandwiches and just really taking in those memories. Those are some excellent memories. So thank you mm -hmm. for sharing that with us. And I like that you started to talk about sports. Of course, this is a lifestyle sports podcast. How did you yourself stay active? Did you play any sports when you were younger, whether that be basketball, mm -hmm. football, did you do any wrestling? I started out with uh, baseball, baseball. Uh, when I was younger, I started with T-ball, uh, a lot of T-ball, and then went into baseball to where I either was third base or pitcher. And I guess at the time, I didn't know anything about it because I was just so young, but I guess I threw sidearm. And that's such a rare thing. And I wasn't even paying attention, but it was incredible for the coaches. And they were just excited that they just had this young kid who could throw a sidearm, which made it challenging for the, the hitters. And uh, But after that, I wanted to go more into contact sports. So from, I think, middle school on, I did wrestling and football. And uh, just wrestling was a lot of my life. It's almost like a year-round sport. It's one of the most, I mean, all the sports take some level of commitment. And at least for me personally, wrestling uh, took a lot of uh, character building and commitment to maintain just the, the conditioning, the, the ability to show up day in, day out and go through that grind for just a couple of minutes on the mat. You're putting in out hundreds and thousands of hours throughout the year in this year around sport that we would do uh, just for a couple of minutes on the mat. And I just, I think I'm really grateful for the coaches uh, and all the mentors that had along the way to help, you know, give me the character to give me a great foundation to eventually where I joined the military. And I think it helped give me a strong start in that career. I was just going to mention that you hit the nail on the head. I was going to say, I wonder if that discipline of being a wrestler and being active at such a young age helped you out when you were younger in the military and currently now just having that discipline. You guys are now listening to Chris Griffin. He is a good friend of mine. We've known each other for about two years. He is a veteran and the founder of Halio Athletica. You guys know that I'm freaking obsessed with that brand. <laughs> I talk about them all the time. I am posting about them all the time. We are going to be discussing the brand in full. Please stay with us. And of course, today it is Veterans Day. So we have the best possible guest that we could be having join us. So let's hop right into it, Griff. Mm -hmm, yes. Being a vet, what exactly does that mean to you? And then I want to get into your photography because guys, what I say, his photography is freaking off the charts. He has shown me 
some stunning photos. So Griff, first off, mm -hmm. what exactly does being a veteran mean to you? To me, it's a great deal. And I feel like a, a majority of veterans, I think, have a very similar emotional attachment to the opportunity to be able to serve in the armed forces. Yes, it's all it's an all volunteer force. But again, it's not every everyone has the opportunity to be able to serve. And I'm, I, it's very unfortunate for those it, it could be a medical condition, it could be a variety of things that help keep them from serving. But there are a lot of other ways that you can serve and be a civil servant and be uh, and work for like the Air Force and a lot of what the military does now, not to go off on a tangent to where uh, if you are a civil servant and you still are part of the Air Force, you're still a part of the Marine Corps, you still are an, an airman to and the way that we recognize it as a whole. It might not necessarily be how society defines it, but again, if you're a part of the team, you're a part of the mission, you are an airman. For me, the ability to be a part of a legacy and a history where all these incredible airmen that came before me and accomplished these amazing things and to be a part of that uh, legacy and history is, is great and for me i just wanted to be able to add the kinds of amazing contributions that they did when i had the opportunities and the challenges in front of me to be able to do that uh, i didn't want to falter and i didn't want to let that down and and that to me it's something that sort of sticks in my mind all we have at the end of the day is our name and our legacy. And and when we have these opportunities to do these incredible things or to help people or to create impacts in lives, it's something that's instilled from you. If you didn't get it from your family uh, from the beginning, when you join military, go through basic military training or you go through the Air Force Academy or whatever route you decide to go in joining the military, you're instilled with these character, uh, this, these integrity uh, traits to again, uh, become the best version of yourself and uphold the values that were uh, created before you got here and that will be maintained well after we're gone. That is such an admirable, inspirational answer. And again, we kind of already poked the bear a little bit. We know that you are involved with photography. Mm -hmm. Let's discuss it. What exactly are you doing when you are getting deployed? I know that you recently mm -hmm. already talked about the fact that you were deployed most of the spring this past year, which is why you were kind of out of touch with mm -hmm. me and other people in the United States. Obviously, you were doing a lot of great things mm -hmm. while being deployed. But let's discuss your photography. How did you get yeah. into it? And what exactly are you photographing while you are out on these missions? Yeah, so uh, for me... I know I enjoyed sort of doing happy snaps before the military, but I never actually thought it was a career that I could really land. And actually going into the Air Force, I was supposed to be a loadmaster. And uh, in simple terms, a loadmaster, for those who don't know what it is, is someone who essentially is there. The pilots will fly the aircraft, the airframe, but let's say you're going to load people into it. Uh, Humvees, any kind of cargo, that that airplane is not going to leave the ground until the loadmaster gives the the thumbs up that everything's secure, ready to go, because you don't need anything shifting in the air or if you need to make some kind of emergency maneuvers. You don't want anything to happen to compromise the airframe into where you're going to lose people's lives and, and the aircraft itself. Uh, and so I was supposed to have that, but then when I got to basic training, they actually lost my contract. And that's a scary thing because you end up going to a job counselor and they sit down with you and they're like, well, we lost your contract. You can either go home, which I didn't want to do. I was from a small town. I just didn't want to stay there and be a pizza delivery guy the rest of my life. Or you can go in open general. And a lot of times what that means is you're going to go be a cop. You're going to go be military police in essence. And that's, that's a very thankless, incredible job what they do. But I know I, I didn't want to do that for my time. But at the same time, I didn't want to go home. So I was like, it's a high likelihood that's that's what I'll do. And I'll just do my time and get out. I'll get use my GI Bill, I'll go to school and, you know, I'll create my future for myself that way. And so I just go and open general. And by the time I go graduate basic training, I'm told I'm essentially going to go be a photographer, which blew my mind. And so what I would say, I was excited initially, but when I was going through school, I was not excited with the process of, of learning great photography because it's a lot of repetition. And so when you'd go out and you'd have a short time and have to go take 100 pictures 
a hundred portraits within an hour, or I'd have to go do certain techniques where I have to frame objects certain ways, or I'd have to use leading lines or diminution, which essentially is I'm showing something vanishing from the foreground to the background. And again, it just seemed like a very repetitive and the, the whole practice itself is sort of like training for sports, but I couldn't make the connection at the, sign, at the time to where when we're practicing certain plays or moves or techniques, again and again and again, it was just a mindset to why I was excited to do that because I was invested in it. For photography, I didn't really make that connection and flip that switch on yet uh, because I think I was so young and just, again, I it wasn't initially what I even wanted to do. And so at first, again, uh, I just did it um, and I grind through it. I wasn't so thrilled, but long, as you progress a little bit, when I got to my first assignment in Alaska, I got probably a year into that, I got published for the first time in a magazine. And that felt great. That felt amazing. And what that did is it made me feel I, I want to get published again. But if I want to get published again, I need to be good at my craft and what I do. Uh, and so it forced me to practice these techniques. And it, it got me to look through life through a different lens and in essence to where if I wanted to attain this, this goal that I put for myself, I'm going to have to put in this extra work again that I applied for sports. And I just that's where I can make those connections and turn on my excitement. And, uh, and really give myself that opportunity. So with that, um, as, I, as I got better and I became obsessed and very passionate with the craft, uh, I had different opportunities to deploy. And so when I go deploy, it's gonna look different. It's looked different every time I've deployed. So the first time I went uh, wasn't for Iraq. I was a young enlisted airman and uh, essentially I went to go support this, this unit in southern Iraq, and I would just uh, help them when it came to uh, training the Iraqi army, or it would be the Iraqi firefighters, uh, helping them get certified and help them more safely fight fires within their villages or within their towns or even their city. And then just really communicate the message of the great things that the, the soldiers and the, the airmen were doing throughout the region at the same time promoting security uh, and sustainability. And then fast forward to my next deployment, I was actually a combat camera and airman. And a lot of my training when I was a combat photographer specifically was meant to uh, work with special warfare, special operations uh, airmen. And so uh, when I actually went and deployed, uh, it would have been throughout the near, it would have been supporting the mission for Syria. And so a lot of it would be to look for uh, bad guys would be looked for if there was going to be chemical weapons or weapon caches, things like that. And a lot of those things different compared if we were to compare what where the imagery went from the Iraq uh, deployment to this Jordan Syria deployment is a lot of the imagery from the Syria Jordan deployment never got released. A lot of that, a lot of those pretty much all that imagery just would get pushed up to upper leadership so they could make more informed decisions on how they're going to uh, respond going forward, where a lot of the imagery I did as a young enlisted airman in Iraq, a lot of that would get published for the world to see so they could see the mission and the great things that we were doing throughout the region. And this last deployment, as I promoted and got more rank, more responsibility, I had the opportunity to go work directly for NATO. And while we're in Bosnia for NATO, NATO a lot of it is to try to, again, uh, get support throughout the country, uh, support the country, support the the armed forces that they have there, and eventually hopefully get them to the point to where they would join NATO as a partner country to where they just become stronger as a whole. So a lot more of that was diplomatic. So we're going, we're meeting a lot with their Ministry of Defense, their leaders within the military. They have three different presidents in that country that all represent a different faction of people. And so a lot of that was more from a diplomatic approach compared to a combat photographer approach compared to the first deployment, which more was like a public affairs, public relations in essence. I know that you mentioned at the beginning, you didn't even necessarily want to be a photographer in the military, mm -hmm. but now it seems like you are honing in at your craft and it sounds like you really fully enjoy being a photographer. Is there anything in particular that you now really enjoy showcasing or having published or having be put on the internet where people like me out in the US, if you're shooting mm -hmm. from Bosnia or somewhere else out in Iraq, and I'm like, wow, like, I wonder who took that shot. That is an incredible mm -hmm. photograph. What can you say is your favorite type of photo to take? My favorite kind of photo, I would say, I enjoy sharing isn't a photo that's going to invoke an emotion. 
it's a lot of times I can't tell you how you're going to respond to it, but a lot of it, I would say, is psychologically going to be tied to someone's own personal life and experiences. So, for instance, let's say I was going to go shoot a t-ball game and there's my whole goal as a storyteller and as a photographer in my craft uh, is to get people that wouldn't initially care about the story that or this thing that I'm trying to highlight and get some uh, spotlight on is to make those people care and do it in a way to where I can sort of trick them into caring. So let's say, again, you go to someone who doesn't enjoy sports. But if I go to this t-ball game, there was going to be, let's say it could be a grandmother. She doesn't necessarily care about sports, but she has a grandson or a granddaughter. And it, we all know, like, in, there's a little cutesy scenario. And I use this sometimes when I teach workshops for military service members, to, again, to, as our job as storytellers is to get people to want to care about the stories we're telling. And again, it's not trying to force them on how to care, but just giving them an opportunity to do so. So again, it's it's if you're at this sports game and you're highlighting that, and a lot of times you see these young kids in these fields that they get bored after about 10 minutes and they're out there picking dandelions or they're laying down and you capture these cute moments. Again, it's not necessarily a sports shot itself, but it is actually at a sports event. They are the athletes on the field. And again, you can really package those kinds of photos together. Again, you have the great shots of them hitting the ball or throwing it or sliding, running around the bases. But again, you have these cute moments to where they're candid little shots that the, the mom is going to love it. The grandmother is going to love it. The person that, that doesn't necessarily care about sports are going to love those little quiet, cute moments. But again, when they look at that, they're going to want to look at the rest of the pictures collectively. But again, they're going to take in the whole scene and the complete story we're trying to share in the first place. And so what I try to do with my photography is that as I want to capture, if I'm trying to tell a story, I'm trying to also capture different things that I know people would respond to that might not necessarily care about the theme of the story I'm trying to tell but there's different elements within there that would make them uh, invest into that and then want to look at the complete collection of imagery together. Well, thank you so much for sharing all that information on your mm -hmm. fabulous photography. For my Boss Babes fanatics that are currently listening to this podcast episode, is there a particular website that people can go and look at this photography if they're interested in searching it out? Or is it only in publications because it is for... The military so for myself uh i know i used to have a website and I'd, I'd have to update it and i don't want to mislead them but i used to have chris griffin photography uh, dot com but again don't hold me to that but i would say i do have stuff on the national geographic site i've been published by national geographic twice rolling stone magazine as well and then also a lot of the stuff i do now i'm the national marketing photo manager for the air force and now the space force so if you go to airforce.com uh, a lot of my imagery you'll see on the website and then space force we actually did a production last week and then we're doing another one next week uh, and we're really updating. They're getting ready to launch the new Space Force website. So a lot of the imagery from that, uh, you're going to see that well, it's going to come from me as well. Well, congratulations. I find that to be super impressive and absolutely fabulous, especially coming from somebody like we talked about that originally didn't even have any aspiration to want to do photography in the military. Mm -hmm. And here you are being published in publications like Rolling Stone and other fabulous, well-known publications. I wanted to switch over it and talk about PTSD. For those yeah. of you guys that might not know what PTSD, of course, being involved in the war, war zone or just being in the military at large, there is the reality of potentially experiencing some type of PTSD. Essentially, PTSD is a disorder in which a person has difficulty after experiencing or witnessing a terrifying event. It could last months or years and the individual oftentimes is triggered by memories. So Griff, I wanted to touch upon this, of course, because today is Veterans Day. And although you may or may not have direct experience with it, I would love for you to discuss it. That way, if somebody listening to this podcast episode may need a coping mechanism, may need to go seek mental health help. That's why I want to lightly touch upon this topic today. So can you share some of your experience with potential PTSD? Yeah, no, of course. Thank you. And this is something that uh, for myself personally hasn't become 
a bigger issue, I think, up until later in life. So a lot of, so I guess to start, go back a little bit, a lot of what my job as a photographer and combat photographer entails is sometimes, unfortunately, taking photos of people that have deceased passed away, whether it's through suicide or through combat situations to where when I was in Iraq, there was a helicopter that went down and unfortunately no one made it. For when I was younger and I first went out, essentially that camera was a barrier between me and uh, the the situation to where emotionally I didn't let it, it bother me. Um, I still, I was there, I still processed it. I was still in the room, I had a job to do. And essentially that's what I would do is condition myself. I'm walk in and almost like this is a movie scene and that it's fake. So I could get in, get with the crime scene commander needed me to do. And uh, so when they do their investigation, they have everything that they need so everything can get done right. As time has gone on and as I've gotten older, I start thinking about it a lot more. It starts affecting me to where I've had friends would notice. And I, I don't, I haven't become angry or violent, but it just thinks where if I have friends that have known me for the longest time and things are out of character. And then uh, I, what I would say first is don't hold it in, speak to somebody. Uh, it's important whether it doesn't matter who it is, whether it's a friend, family member, a coworker, someone that is just willing to listen, it's important to get it out and not leave it in. You know, and a lot of times what you'll realize is even a complete stranger off the street is going to care. They're going to uh, be there for you. And essentially, you know, you might create a bond. And But again, it creates this outlet to where it helps us decompress, uh, helps us to where the dam isn't, doesn't feel like it's going to build up and, and break and explode. It's important to where, for me at least, to communicate and to share and to the point where I would get help and I would go see mental health professionals and and uh, and just be able to process it and, and learn uh, and for a healthy way to deal with it. So again, I know I, would, I don't do anything to essentially lead down a darker path. But yeah, and the, I would say too, it's going to be different for everybody. Everyone, that's what, again, we're all in the military, but the thing is we're all unique uh, individuals. We all come from different walks of lives. All, the thing is what some thing that might be hard for you is easy for me and something that might be hard for me is really easy for you. So again, and that's why it's this thing to where I think it's very important for people to be sensitive, open and empathetic for a lot of these situations. And that's why I think there are a lot of incredible people and organizations out there to be able to help you uh, and that truly authentically care and to be able to get you the help that you need because it's important. And again, I'm going through it um, again, younger, I just, it didn't affect me, but as I get older um, again, it's, it's sort of risen up. And again, I'm, uh, I'm not being stubborn. A lot of us are, a lot of us veterans can be, but it's important again, if you know, your loved ones and your friends are saying to get the help, don't cheat them because of yourself. And if not for yourself, do it for them. Find that again, that, that motivation uh, to go ahead and commit and get help for you. Well, Griff, thank you so much for being so open and vulnerable and sharing your own personal experiences, because I feel there will be some people listening to this lifestyle sports podcast episode today whether it be themselves that needs to go seek help or a healthy coping mechanism like you're speaking about. If you guys are listening to this podcast episode, whether it be you, our friend, a family member, somebody that you might be dating, please talk to them. Please listen to them. As Griff is speaking about, there are a number of places you can go seek for mental health or journaling. You can journal, you can meditate. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of healthy ways to cope with PTSD. And I will wrap up this topic because of course, I don't want to trigger anybody completely. Um, so we will switch on over. But again, thank you, Griff, for sharing your own personal experiences with PTSD. Let's switch on over to bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. So aside from being a fabulous photographer, being a veteran, growing up in North Carolina, now living in Texas, and of course, being a freaking entrepreneur, you are a man of many <laughs> amazing feats like you are absolutely incredible and i'm wishing you the best i love working alongside you how the heck did you get involved in the professional bodybuilding and fitness world honestly i mean 
who would yeah i don't know but uh, but going back i think again it ties to my career in the military the air force i was I'm always into sports always into working out staying fit and then getting older you know going from a teenager to a, a young man my body maturing i'm able to actually pack on more muscle and i just enjoyed that itself but um also when i was stationed in alaska i befriended somebody who named heidi uh, heidi summers and then long story short you know, fast forward, I moved to San Antonio for the first time. She applies to go to UTSA. We just become good friends, become roommates. I move away and come back in 2015. And so when I come back, it's at, I think, the peak of or the very beginning of when Instagram was becoming, It's they had their first fitness influencers. You could essentially name the top 10 or 15 fitness influencers at the time where now we have tens of thousands. But uh, Heidi wanted to create her own company. And I'm the kind of person to where I just like to sort of figure things out and uh, just do it for myself, not always outsource it. And so I just YouTube things, I Google things, and essentially got to the point to where we created uh, her business that she has now. And uh, it was incredible. And I enjoyed my time with her. But it was also very taxing because, again, being active duty full time, creating this business for Heidi and growing that, which, again, that's another full time position. I got got to where... I need to take a break, but then someone else heard what I did for Heidi and uh, they reached out and said, hey, can I help them too? So I spent the next year doing the same thing for them as well. And it's gone extremely well for them as too. Again, it's one of those things I was getting taxed. I was getting worn out, but I needed a way to recharge my batteries. And I think the best way to do that again was a break. Uh, Because again, these are great businesses. They were great things, but it was also theirs. And I think they they had a great following. Uh, They had great impacts in people's lives. But again, uh, I just needed better work life balance for myself. And again, I needed that sort of the same thing tying back to photography. I needed that excitement or to look at life through a lens or what I was engaging with and investing my time with in a way to where I was going to be excited and committing. Uh, all my complete energy to where it was going to feel like the passion that I had for photography. And that's where, after taking that break, I created Halio. And I used uh, the network uh, along the ways that I helped build for these other businesses when it came to the manufacturing, to the new friendships and relationships that I had with the different fitness influencers, Olympians, UFC fighters, and to where I used the access to great manufacturing when it came to sourcing the materials. And then two, with my job, again, uh, for Air Force marketing, national marketing, I was able to, again, package all these different skill sets and experiences that I've combined over the time into this amazing company that I've been blessed to create Halio. And with Halio, I wanted to be able to do it. It's just not about selling clothes, but making impacts in people's lives. Again, Halio is an acronym for being honest, authentic, loyal, integrity, and being original. And these aren't just words that I picked out of the air that I just want to connect to a brand. These are things that I feel like are instilled into me. So what that does is it makes it to where Halio as a brand is that I'm not going to be chasing fads. I'm not going to be chasing what's popular in the moment through culture. I'm just going, it's going to stay the course and it's stay, going to stay consistent. So as people come in, they're able to experience, they learn what the mission is, they learn what the products are and they enjoy them. It's not, there's no going to be, there's not going to be any hard rights or left along this journey in a sense to where they're going to feel tricked in a way the brands were for the brand's integrity and what what they essentially got they bought in on i was gonna say i can kind of segue into that i think it's Mm -hmm. awesome that you are essentially piggybacking off of your time with those olympians with Mm -hmm. those bodybuilders within the fitness world i'm going to give you guys some background on halio athletica because again Mm -hmm. you guys know that i am obsessed with the brand I love the fact that their items are buttery soft. They have booty lifting, squat proof leggings. So if you are freaking active, this is the brand you want to go for. They have sports bras. They have different types of tops and t-shirts. I think they actually came out with shorts. I'll have Griff talk about that in a sec as well. They fit all shapes and sizes for women. Very versatile. One of my favorite freaking things about Halio Athletica is the fact that I can go walk my dog in the tight pants and the tight top, go for a workout if I want, and then go literally 
jump in the shower, rinse off really quickly after a workout. And if I want to, and I forgot to pack an outfit, I can just wear that same sexy, cute outfit and throw on a little jacket over it, and I'm ready to go to brunch. You guys have seen me wear their items to baseball games with a little baseball cap and a little fitted crop top jacket. You guys have seen me post photos walking down the street with my dog or at a workout. So, like, the best part about Halio Athletica, not only is the products freaking affordable, fit women, different shapes, different sizes. They have so many fabulous items that are different colors. They have different patterns. And again, above all, the fact that the items are versatile, you don't just have to wear them at a workout. You can wear them to brunch. If you want, you can wear them to a afternoon date with your man. I'm about to do it actually later on today. I'm going to get lunch with my boyfriend because he's coming right from a workout. So why am I going to dress up and wear a dress when I know he's going to be in workout attire? You know for damn sure I'm throwing on some Halio Athletica pants and a top and tossing a little freaking cropped jacket over it. So, Griff, you yeah. already said what Halio stands for and the reason why you enjoy that name is because it's authentic and original and honest to you and your purchasers. Mm -hmm. But let's let's talk a little bit more about how you got involved with the brand and how do you create these select items in the different styles for people like myself to purchase? Well, I think that's uh, just like everything. It's it's a collective when it comes to trusting. I have an amazing community. We have right now well over 200 ambassadors. And so I think, again, starting going back and helping building these first companies, I was able to learn along the way and uh, what are realistic designs and realistic things that people would enjoy and what are things to stay away from that seem more faddish and again it's uh and and i applied these things working for these uh two other companies to where when it came to mine my mindset was i wanted to create something for everybody uh just not the the perceived fitness influencer that's on instagram or TikTok, but something to where it could be you know the mother that's seven months pregnant it could be uh the young girl it could be the older grandmother to where they could be either doing yoga or again they're going doing a grocery store run or they're doing shopping around town getting ready for christmas i wanted to create designs again that were comfortable regardless of the experience or the activity that you're doing and it's going to be applicable and at the same time when it comes to uh the colors the colors and the sourcing of the material it's again it's being comfortable and what i've learned along the way uh and is that the not only the team but the customers and the community that Halio has been able to grow is they're very honest with me and so and as much as i would love to create the perfect one singular legging that could solve all the problems the thing is we all enjoy things that are differently and so it could come down to how does the fabric feel it comes the the fit of the legging it comes to the design of the legging so when it comes to how the seam uh, curves around the booty in the back or even the front seam you know some people love them some people hate them and so that's why we offer such a variety so as we're sourcing these things and over the years of having halio essentially me taking all this feedback and all, and, as, and also as i'm sampling new designs i'm really combining this collective feedback and these patterns that i'm getting and i'm uh, essentially, and putting those into each and every new piece. So as our current uh, followers and supporters and customers come in, they're getting the products they love. But also as we grow and new people are coming in, they're going to be able to find that legging that's perfect for them. Uh, and me not just try to design one legging and force them to enjoy that. And again, that's sort of the mindset when it comes into designing uh, the leggings that we have now. And I know that you newly, a couple of weeks ago, just mm -hmm. launched a brand new collection called the Hustle Collection. I'll have you discuss the Hustle Collection, what mm -hmm. colors can be found in the Hustle Collection, and why did you name it the Hustle Collection? Yeah, in the Hustle Collection, uh, you can find uh, an amazing vibrant red. You have uh, a nice, uh, almost like it's a muted canary yellow, and then you have a very vibrant blue. And these are things that, again, we 
we want to have, I know there's a lot of seasonal colors uh, that, that you'll see business and brands put out, but at the same time, we like to offer colors that will sort of contrast that because uh, as it gets harder, sometimes you're trying to replace leggings that have holes in them or are just worn out, but those colors aren't available because it's not that time of year. That color is not going to be uh, on some other website or even at the store. And so that's why we sort of went with those colors right now, just to sort of go against the grain. But two, the Hustle Collection, uh, the whole mindset behind that is we're all hustling. We're all grinding in our own different way. And these leggings, I think, are are designed with that in mind, where regardless of the kind of hustle that you're in, whether you're going to school full time, let's say you're a nurse working two different shifts, you can wear them for that. Or if you're doing you're competing for a fitness show, a bodybuilding competition, and they're going to withstand that. And at the same time, they're going to be as comfortable as when you put them on towards the end of the day. They're not going to wear out on you. And so it's this is the hustle collection embodies that per, those those groups of individuals that are all grinding and hustling uh, for the opportunity to get to that better version of themselves. And that's, you know, every path is different. We just want to have that opportunity to share that journey with them. And what is the future of Halio? I know you guys are always putting out fabulous brand new mm -hmm. products. Like we just discussed the hustle yeah. collection. You're always coming out with new patterns, new colors. Mm -hmm. Again, we just spoke about the t-shirts. I think you have shorts out now. What is your ultimate vision for Halio? Ultimate vision for Halio uh, is, again, it's what it is right now. As we continue to grow and offer uh you know great pieces which again it's instrumental that we have that so people um as a lot of us are gonna a lot of the new followers and people that are exposed to halio are gonna initially be based off of someone that they see wearing something that thinks cute or adorable or they love the color and they come to the site but while they're on the site and as I, we try to educate them as long as they stay, is that we try to get involved into the community and different organizations and offer uh, a, a way to impact people's lives. And again, we've done things to where uh, Paul's 22, to where we've raised funds to help cover the service costs for veterans that need uh, their service animals, but the fees are so expensive. It could be between five, seven, even 12 grand to get their service animal and uh, they can't afford that and the VA can't really cover that. So we try to help raise money for that or it could be for a fresh start program. Do we have individuals that are getting released from from jail or prison? But again, it's they've served their time. They've they've done what they've needed to do. But again, when they get their fresh start, they're not just the ones impacted. Their children are going to be impacted. Their wives or husbands are going to be impacted. And again, it's helping them get through that transition and through that that challenge of getting that fresh start and it's making it a little bit easier not just not about them but also the collective family unit then we've also done a clean water initiative to where in third world countries would help raise money to, to uh, dig wells for fresh water but not just that a clean water initiative also is going to be cleaning up the ponds and lakes and beaches around the country around america so we, we've been a part of that as well. So again, as Halio as a business, as a brand, again, we want to expand the line and offer great products for people to enjoy. But as they, they join us on this journey, we want to educate them. When they purchase this apparel, this is an impact they're making on people's lives as well. Well, thank you so much for sharing how both you and Halio are also getting involved giving back to the local communities, whether that be local or across seas. Again, for my Boss Babes fanatics, thank you so much for listening today. I'm your host, Brittany Baldy. You know that we love talking about how our fabulous guests like Chris Griffin give back to their local areas. So you are freaking fabulous. I am so glad that you are on here with me today. Because again, my listeners hear me talk about Halio all the time in my podcast. They are seeing me post about Halio all the time on my social media. So I'm like, I gotta get Griff on here. Before we wrap up, mm -hmm. I know we've talked about everything from yeah. <laughs> being a veteran, being a photographer, living in Texas like you are now, growing mm -hmm. up in North Carolina, having your sisters that kind of used to playfully ball yeah. bust you, I guess, when you were younger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and everything in between. What are your future ventures? Do you have anything in the works currently right now that you can talk about, whether it be something for Halio or are you going to start your own charity? Are you going to do anything fun for the holidays? 
What do you have coming up, Chris? Like coincidentally, tomorrow I'm going to be getting married. So I mean, that's I know that's pretty close. Well, well hold on a second. You're getting married. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know. Hello. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's pretty. You know, I've, uh, personal life sometimes is pretty kept low key just because of how much, how much we're just invested into uh, you know the social landscape. Megan who is incredible and she's very patient with me and the ambitions and the, the things that I'm doing. It's very sweet. Uh, I'm the luckiest man on the planet. She's you know going to be a school teacher. She's finishing her degree to be a math teacher for middle school. So God bless her soul. I mean, who to teach math in middle school isn't, uh, that's, that's, that inspires me to be a better person. But yeah, I'd say that is probably the biggest, craziest thing uh, in the near future that I'm going to be doing. Well, first off, congratulations to both you and Megan. I hope you guys have awesome weather. Um, if you guys are going on a honeymoon, mm -hmm. I can't wait to hear about it. Maybe I'll get you back on this podcast in the springtime. Uh -huh. We can talk about the holidays yeah. and, and recap on Halio and talk about the wedding and all that good stuff if you want to share. Of course. Um, as, as we wrap up this podcast episode again, happy Veterans Day to all of the veterans out there. Thank you for serving our great country. And Griff, shout out your personal social media if you want to, yes. if you have it. If not, you can just shout out your Halio Athletica social media. That way people know where to go shop. Again, guys, please check out HalioLA.com. That is H-A-L-I-O-L-A.com yeah. -O -O mm -hmm. if you want to shop and check out the fabulous items that they have for sale. Griff, what's your social media? <laughs> Yeah. So what I would say to, yep, yeah, uh, Halio underscore LA would be for Instagram, but I would say to, uh, if you are listening it, uh, to this week or throughout November, we're going to have our black early black Friday sale, uh, this week. And again, we're going to have another one towards the end of the month, but you will be able to use the boss babes, uh, discount code or Brittany's discount code, uh, on the site along with the current prices. So you'll get leggings as low as, you know, $10, $8. Uh, which is incredible, but uh, the whole the whole mindset behind this again is to try to get people that want to enjoy Halio lowest risk possible on their pocketbook, and at the same time, if you already love it, you're gonna be able to buy Christmas presents for next to nothing for your friends and family. Fabulous, awesome! Thank you so much. I will actually go ahead and do a story today, um, mm -hmm. and throughout the month, I will be promoting that for you because again, I love the brand. I personally wear it all the time. Like I said, guys, I'm currently wearing a sports bra as we speak and I'm wearing a pair of leggings. So all I'm going to do after I finish up this interview, I'm like I said, my boyfriend's wrapping up his workout. I'm going to go meet up with him and one of his former baseball teammates. We're going to grab lunch. So instead of me putting on like a fancy dress, I'm literally going to take a like denim crop jacket, throw it over Perfect. my outfit and bam, mm -hmm. it's, it's fabulous. Yeah. And you guys can do the same exact thing. Well, Griff, thank you so much for coming on this podcast. Yeah, I fully having enjoyed me. having you on here. Thank you for sharing everything with us as well. No, again, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, you have an amazing show. You've been an amazing partner and friend over the last two years. And again, uh, I look forward yeah, for the opportunity to come in the future. Again, if you can make time for me, but thank you for the, the time and the experience. We will be making time for you. You know that. <laughs> <Awesome>. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> thank you. Take care.